James Whitey Bulger, one of the FBI's 10 most wanted and a legendary Boston crime boss, is a fugitive no more. Margaret Warner has the story. He's been in hiding for 16 years, but James Whitey Bulger, wanted for 19 murders and countless crimes, was finally apprehended last night at this apartment complex in Santa Monica, California. Yeah. Today in Boston, U.S. Attorney Carmen Ortiz celebrated the end of the long manhunt for the city's mythic gang leader. And this is a great day for Boston's law enforcement community. Over the years, tips placed Bulger around the country and the world. But earlier this week, the FBI renewed efforts to find him and his longtime girlfriend, Catherine Grieg. A public service announcement running in 14 cities where the couple was thought to have ties focused attention on Grieg. Have you seen this woman? The FBI is offering $100,000 for tips leading to Catherine Grieg's whereabouts. It worked. On Wednesday, a tip pointed to the Santa Monica apartment. Although there are those who have doubted our resolve at times over the years, it has never wavered. We followed every lead, we explored every possibility, and when those leads ran out, we did not sit back and wait for the phone to ring. For decades, Bulger had been the reputed leader of the Irish mob in South Boston and an FBI informant. His alleged brutality inspired Jack Nicholson's character in the mob movie The Departed. Swear on your mother's grave. But Bulger disappeared suddenly in 1995 after being tipped off by his FBI handler of his pending indictment on racketeering charges. Now at age 81, he will finally face murder charges in Boston and in Oklahoma City and Miami. And for more on Whitey Bulger's criminal career and larger-than-life aura in Boston, we turn to Dick Lair, an attorney and former reporter for the Boston Globe. He's the author of Black Mass, The Irish Mob, The FBI, and A Devil's Deal. He currently teaches journalism at Boston University. And Mr. Lair, welcome. Tell us a little more about Whitey Bulger. What put an Irish mobster on the 10 most wanted FBI list, along with the likes of Osama bin Laden? It's an epic story uh, that has many chapters to it. The first piece is that he was a crime boss of the Irish gang in Boston, overseeing the underworld for nearly two decades. But the big piece of it is that he is at the center of the uh, FBI's worst informant scandal in its history. Um, after In the mid-1970s, when he agreed to provide information for the FBI, he quickly turned the tables and compromised a handful of agents in Boston, and they in effect became his private security team, uh, keeping him posted on, on activities in law enforcement that was trying to catch him, uh, tipping off the names of people who were trying to inform on him. Uh, some of these people ended up dead. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a long and dark and dirty story. Now, how did he corrupt the Bureau? I mean, was it with money? Was it the value of his information? Because uh, he was trying to help them roll up the Italian mafia in Boston, right? Or New England? Yeah, and the mid, you know, this, is, this, this really involves a hist you know, history here. I mean, we're talking about the mid-1970s when an agent by the name of John Conley, his, his handler all these years, he grew up in South Boston. There was a personal relationship involved here. Uh, that, that goes back to their boyhoods. Uh, Whitey Bulger was a little bit older than John Conley, and when John Conley was an agent in Boston, there was a premium in, in the Bureau of developing underworld informants, and John Conley turned to Whitey Bulger uh, and said, you know, join us and we'll, we'll take out, it'll, it'll work for both of us. We can go after the, the, the LCN, the, the mafia in the north end of the city. But again, it quickly turned where, Ma, uh, where Bulger uh, compromised Conley and, and through Conley other agents so that they were in effect working for him. Now what about his, he had a brother who was leader of the Massachusetts Senate, very powerful but on the law-abiding law side. Uh, uh, how did they choose different paths? Well, yeah, I mean you're, you're, you're referring to Bill Bulger who for many years was the most powerful politician in Massachusetts as president of the state Senate. And this is one of those great Boston stories, a tale of two brothers. There's younger Bill, who you know went to Boston College and law school and became a politician, and then Whitey, uh, that grew up in the same bedroom in a housing project in South Boston, who went in a different direction. It, it, to be honest, you had, in Canada, they, you know, they shared a lot of the same personality traits in terms of intimidation. But Bulger stayed inside. You know, Bill Bulger stayed inside the lines at the state house and and you know ran the show there in a, in a different way than his brother did on the streets. Now, then he disappears. Uh, Whitey Bulger does in '95. What did that do to his reputation in Boston? 
his aura? Well, you know, again, going back to the first chapter of his reputation, uh, for the longest time, he was perceived as, as kind of a lovable gangster from South Boston, a Robin Hood who looked after his neighborhood. And it was a public image that, had been, that was uh, promoted by his, handler, his corrupt handler at the FBI, John Conley, who maintained many relationships with reporters. Uh, by the time he takes off in 1995, all this has washed away. The, the, the horrible truth has been tumbling out for, you know, in court hearings and in, in other cases and in journalism in the city. Um, and so by this time, you know, the, the mythology was gone, uh, and it just added to the, to the cynicism in the city that, yet again, he was tipped off, he got ahead of everybody, and for 16 years, uh, he's been on the run. So what does his capture mean for both the FBI uh, and for Boston? Well, let's start with the FBI. Uh, ever since he, he ran in, in January of 1995, uh, there's been a huge cloud over the Boston office of the FBI uh, on top of the corruption that had, uh, that had spilled out. Um, so f for the FBI, it was really important that they be part of his capture uh, today, yesterday and today, of, you know, and hopefully to move forward and, and to get past uh, all the talk that's been the water cooler talk of this city and beyond in law enforcement circles. Uh, where's Whitey? Uh, does the FBI really want to get him? Or are they still trying to protect him? The FBI can now begin, hopefully, to move past that. As far as Boston, there's just, just a huge collective sigh of relief. I mean, anybody in the city, and particularly in his neighborhood, who had a family member who was killed by him, who was intimidated by him, shaken down, uh, you know, finally this guy uh, who was at the center of it all, uh, you know, is, is going to be coming back to Boston and go to court. Uh, it's long overdue, but here it is. Dick Lair from Boston, thank you so much. You're welcome. And finally tonight, murder, drug deals, gangsters, and a decades-long crime spree. It's all on display at the trial of a reputed Boston mob boss. Judy Woodruff has our update in a conversation she recorded yesterday. The trial is on break for the holiday, but for several weeks, prosecutors have been making their case against James Whitey Bulger. Testimony at times has portrayed him as a cold-blooded killer turned FBI informant, as well as a drug lord feared on the streets of South Boston in the 70s and the 80s. Convicted murderers, drug dealers, bookies, and former FBI authorities have all been called to the stand. So have sons, daughters, siblings, and girlfriends of those allegedly murdered by Bulger and the mob. Kevin Cullen, a reporter and columnist for the Boston Globe, has been there for all of it. He's the co-author of a book about Bulger. Kevin Cullen, thank you for being with us. Again, tell us about the, the most powerful testimony you've been listening to. Well, Judy, I think it's interesting because obviously um, a lot of the people that had testified against um, Whitey Bulger are from the wrong side of the tracks. They're criminals themselves. Uh, there was a corrupt FBI agent named John Morris who just spent a few days on the stand. And these are nefarious people, and uh, particularly the hitman John Moderano, who was up there for several days. I described in one of my columns that a a after the first two days of his testimony, we were hit by punishing rains. Uh, he is such a venal, venal and vile man who's admitted to murdering 20 people that it was almost as if there was a higher power that needed to wash us of our having to listen to this guy. But I think the most powerful testimony over the last two weeks have come from ordinary people. Because there was a myth that the government, particularly the FBI and the Justice Department, wanted you to accept when it came to Whitey Bulger, is that he only killed other criminals. Well, that died on the waterfront of South Boston with a man named Michael Donahue in 1982. And his family has been in court every day for the last few weeks. And yesterday, John Morris, that corrupt FBI agent, who helped get Michael Dunyu murdered, turned to the family and apologized to them. Now that murder happened 31 years ago, and this is the first time anyone remotely connected to this government has apologized to the Dunyu family. As Pat Dunyu, Michael's widow, who raised three boys on her own after her husband was murdered with FBI complicity, as she said to me, it's a little late for an apology, but, um, and the, the, but, if you look at the Dunyu family, the way they have been dragged through the mud by their own government, uh, the idea that the FBI got their, their husband and their father killed is one thing, but the Justice Department refused to apologize to them, refused to settle with them, dragged mm. them through nine years of litigation, 
And so to see that apology in the court was one of the most emotional moments. And it really had nothing to do with testimony. It really wasn't evidence. It was just a sign of emotion and humanity in, in a place where this, that has been sorely lacking. And, and there's so many pieces to this story, Kevin Cullen. How, how altogether has the prosecution tried to portray Bulger? Well, I think, Judy, in your, in your build-up, you described it perfectly. They've described him as a cold-blooded murderer. They've described him as an FBI informant. And they've described him as somebody who, you know, allowed drugs to go through uh, South Boston, where there were some people, sycophants of him, and particularly of his politician brother, Bill Bulger, who said that Whitey kept drugs out of Southie. Now, I lived there in the 80s and 90s, and I knew that was baloney because there were drugs everywhere in South Boston. And the last couple of days, drug dealers have begun to get on the stand, and they'll continue to get on the stand. And what, they got, what they've been testifying to today is that Whitey Bulger took a cut of everything in that town. He took millions of dollars from the drug trade, but put out this charade that he wasn't involved in drugs, that he actually chased drug dealers out of South Boston. That was the other myth, myth that he and his apologists propagated. But there was a drug dealer named Billy Shea up there today, and he explained how Whitey actually sent him to set up a cocaine business, but instructed him, make sure that nobody knows I'm involved. But every week, Whitey was getting his cut. Sometimes it was as little as $3,000 a week. Sometimes when they got into the, in the cocaine in a big way in the 1980s, Whitey Bulger yeah. was getting $10,000 a week for, for overseeing that drug empire. I, I gather that the Bulger is acknowledging uh, that he did a lot of these things, his role in some of the murders, the drug deals, but it's, it's the idea of being an informant uh, for the FBI that he rejects. Uh, how does that Correct. fit into what his defense uh, is saying? Well, so far, Judy, that is the essence of his defense. And from a legal perspective, it's quite odd because Whitey Bulger is facing more than 30 counts in a racketeering indictment, 19 of which refer to murders. But Whitey Bulger is not charged with being an informant. That's not a crime. But his defense is spending almost 90 percent of its argument in its, it, in its uh, cross-examination of witnesses hammering at the point. They're arguing a technicality. They're saying that Whitey Bulger never signed his informant reports. He never gave his fingerprints. He, he never allowed his photograph to be taken and put with his informant reports. But, you know, as somebody who's covered this world for a long time, Judy, that's specious. That is a specious argument. Um, it, it's pretty obvious, like I said, that the public record is going in there. There are all these reports. The defense is arguing that the reports were totally made up by one agent, John Conley, his handler, and John Morris, the corrupt supervisor who just t testified. So it sounds as it, only in a few seconds left, Kevin Cullen, uh, sounds like they're not putting up much of a defense is what you're saying. Well, like I said, I remember talking to Gwen about this a couple weeks ago, Judy, and I said that the defense went in there and copped to about 80 percent of the indictment. Right. They admitted that he's a racketeer and extortionist. So they're very specific. They're arguing the, the, that he's not an informant, and they hope that while he admits to all these other things, then he'll be able to convince the jury he didn't kill those women. The two women he's charged with, that's what he can't live with. And I think the, the strategy is if, look, I've admitted to these other things, why won't you believe me when I say I didn't kill these women? Kevin Cullen with the Boston Globe. The trial uh, resumes on Monday. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Now, a reputed mobsters trial replete with threats, profanity, and courtroom drama winds down in Boston. Margaret Warner has that. Both sides made their closing arguments today in the eight-week-long murder and racketeering trial of Whitey Bulger, the notorious chief of an Irish mafia, the Winter Hill Gang, active in South Boston in the 1970s and 80s. Bulger fled Boston in 1994 after being tipped off he was about to be indicted, living underground until his arrest by the FBI in California in 2011. Jurors have heard testimony from more than 70 witnesses related to 33 charges of murder, extortion, money laundering, and illegal weapons possession. Columnist Kevin Cullen, who co-wrote the book Whitey Bulger, has been following the story for the Boston Globe and joins us now. And Kevin, welcome back to the program. 
Thanks, Margaret. So first of all, give us a feel for what it was like in the courtroom today after what have been eight weeks of really gruesome testimony as, as the case near is entering this final phase. Well, one thing I think is that People walked out of court today tired because uh, the, the court had been running basically from nine to one every day, and we didn't get out of there until about quarter or five because the closings went on very long. And uh, as I, I was actually just playing with the top of my column for tomorrow's Boston Globe, and I said, if you begin with the premise that all closing arguments are theater, this was much more like Harold Pinter's betrayal than it was like Edward Albee's Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? because the characters weren't shouting at each other as much as circling each other um, and trying to outdo each other. Well, and uh, the prosecutor, I'm sorry. Would, well, tell us about the prosecution. Something? What was the nub of their case? I know they had nearly three hours to make it. And what was the defense sort of counter argument? Because I gather the defense well, has admitted he's committed many of these crimes. Correct. The prosecution had so much to lay out there that it actually went over those three hours. They went about three and a half. And it was a, I guess the best way to, to, to it was a workman's like performance by Fred Wyshack. It was a sort of a more or less straightforward recitation. And when you sit there and listen to it, you realize that they are assembling what is, would be described as a mountain of evidence against Whitey Bulger. We t he talked about, he went through each of the 32 indict, uh, counts of the indictment and 19 of those were for murders. And so he went through who was murdered, why they were murdered if in fact they knew why they were murdered, and how Bulger played a role, whether it was hands-on as a killer, whether he was driving what they call the crash car, which is the backup car in, in a hit, so you could crash into anybody that might get in the way of the assassination team, uh, whether he was driving the car when somebody killed somebody, and it was, it was gruesome to listen to, to be frank. Uh, and then when they, the government was done presenting its case, um, Hank Brennan and then Jay Carney as the defense counsel got up and gave their uh, recitation. And I think, Margaret, what was noticeable for about the defense is that they never basically said anything about the direct charges against Whitey Bulger. They put the government on trial. They were basically saying, don't look at my client, look at the government, look at the FBI, look at the Justice Department that enabled him. And so there was, I guess, what the, a government person would say, they was trying to engage in jury nullification or to encourage a jury to engage in jury nullification. Both defense lawyers, when they finished up with their summations, basically said, acquit my client. If you want to send a message to the government that was corrupt and protected this guy and helped kill, get people killed, acquit my client. But they didn't say that. They basically said, you can send a message to the government. It was, it was left unsaid. I, I, what I found amusing about that is so much of what we've been hearing in testimony is that so much of the things that the government passed on to Whitey Bulger was not explicit. It was wink, wink, nod, nod. And as Steve Fleming, his partner in crime, said, if you tell us information about people and we kill one guy, and then you tell us information about another guy and we kill him, and then you tell information about a third guy and we kill him, everybody knows what's going on. And you mentioned Steve Fleming. He was one of the three star witnesses against Bulger, gangsters who'd been part of his operation, who've turned on him. It, mm -hmm. Does the prosecution, does the outcome of this case rest on that or on what the juror, that is them, the jurors believing, those three men in particular? Or does it rest more on whether they think the FBI, which is, was in this sort of corrupt relationship with Bulger, is to be believed at all? Well, I, I think that unless we get inside the head of the jurors, we, we can't answer that question accurately. But clearly, the prosecution saying, admitting the government was wrong in these cases, and the FBI agent, specifically John Conley, who was a handler of Whitey Bulger, he, that he's serving time now for actually helping Bulger kill somebody. And they're saying, look, the guys that surrounded themselves around Bulger's were bad people. They were sadistic people. They were killers. They were thugs. And in Steve Fleming's case, they were quite depraved. Now, the, the defense is saying you can't believe any of these guys because they're such bums. They're such sociopaths. They're such evil people. And then the, the government gets back up there in rebuttal and says, wait a minute. Don't, it's not about the witnesses. It's about who were the witnesses friends with? Who was their boss? Who did they associate with? And that's the man sitting at the table yet. So, yes, it does come down to whether you believe. I don't even think it's believe the witnesses. The question is, do you believe that the witnesses really were 
in cahoots with Whitey Bulger. And I have to be honest, sitting where I sat, the evidence was pretty overwhelming. Well, Kevin Cullen of the Boston Globe, thank you. And I'm, I'm sure we'll be back to you as, uh, as this case goes to the jury. Thanks. Thanks. And now the verdict in the trial of mob boss James Whitey Bulger. A jury in federal court found him guilty on more than 30 counts today, including murder, racketeering and extortion as the head of the notorious Winter Hill Gang. Bulger, now 83 years old, was convicted of 11 of 19 murders that prosecutors said he committed or helped orchestrate in Boston during the 1970s and 80s. He spent 16 years on the run, becoming one of the FBI eyes most wanted before he was finally captured in June 2011. During his days in Boston, Bulger also was an FBI informant. And dark history with the gangster became a big focus of the trial. U.S. Attorney Carmen Ortiz acknowledged that as she praised the verdict. This day of, of reckoning for Bulger has been a long time in coming. Too long. In fact, Due to his decades long of corruption and corrupting law enforcement officials in this city. And it was a corruption that not only allowed him to operate a violent organization in this town, but it also allowed him to slip away when honest law enforcement was closing in. I hope that the victims, the families, and many others who suffered tremendously and in some cases were actually destroyed by James Bulger's criminal actions will take some solace in the fact that he will spend the rest of his life in prison. Bulger's defense attorney, Jay Carney, said his client would appeal, but he noted that Bulger was not convicted of other murder charges made by the prosecution. Jim Bulger was very pleased at how the trial went and even pleased by the outcome. Uh, I don't think he expected that nine times the jury would come back and say not guilty or not proven. It was important to him uh, that the government corruption be exposed and important to him that people see firsthand the deals that the government was able to make with certain people. To walk us through the verdict, we are joined once again by Kevin Cullen. He's a columnist with the Boston Globe. Welcome back to the News Hour, Kevin. First of all, tell us about the scene in the newsroom when the jury uh, reported the verdict. Well, uh, it was pretty obvious that the the families. One thing I saw uh, facing them, I could see over Whitey's shoulder. I was in the. Uh, I actually was purposely in the, lo the other courtroom where the camera was on Whitey and I could see the families in back of him. And uh, the Dunahue family was obviously um, thrilled. The Davis family was crushed. The Leonard family was crushed because uh, those murders in the Davis case, that was one of the women. He was charged with 19 murders, Judy. The only two he really objected to were the women because that flew in the face of his uh, phony narrative as this gangster with scruples. And uh, he was convicted of the murder of Deborah Hussey, who was the stepdaughter of his partner in crime, Steve Flemmy. And the jury came back uh, with a no finding in the killing of Deborah Davis. Now, I heard uh, his lawyer just describe that he was pleased with the findings. Um, I would say that that is putting the best face on a very bad day for Whitey Balder because the jury convicted him of 11 of 19 murders. It was pretty obvious to us in Press Row that the, ju that the jury did a very meticulous job, and in any murder or any criminal act that he was charged with, there was not corroborative evidence. They did not convict. So in a lot of the old murders in the 70s that, that involved gangland murders, when it was just John Moderano, the witness, when it was just his word, the jury said, we're not going for that. Anytime there was anything that supported, there was a corroborating witness or corroborating event, the jury convicted. He was convicted of almost all charges. So, like I said, the defense can spin it as much as they want. Whitey Bulger is going to die in prison. And the idea that he did not kill women, well, I'm sorry, the jury said otherwise. What was his reaction when the, when the verdicts were read? No emotion. No emotion whatsoever. I looked at his face. That's where my eyes were, right on his face. And he did, showed no emotion whatsoever. Ex he played it like a poker player. Explain a, a, a little bit more about the difference between the, 
the murder counts that he was going to, of course, there were racketeering, extortion charges as well. But what were the principal differences between the counts he was found guilty on and the ones he was not? Well, it comes to corroborating evidence. As I said, if we, I went through the charges that he was, they found not proven. Um, I only heard one not guilty, and the not guilty was on an extortion of a bookmaker named Kevin Hayes. And that was the only one I heard. Everything else I heard was not proven. That's a distinction. Uh, and then obviously in the Deborah Davis killing, it was uh, no finding. That means the jurors were split. That some thought there wasn't enough evidence, some thought there was. Uh, but if you look, if you go down there and parse it, Judy, what you will see is that whenever it was just the word of John Monterano, not supported by either Kevin Weeks, a, a very key witness, or Steve Fleming himself, that the jury f did not uh, find him guilty of those counts. And you were you were saying the families of the women, the woman uh, whose murder he was found not Steve guilty Davis. of, they were uh, upset. Well, he was upset. I mean, Steve Davis and I actually had lunch together waiting for the verdict. And, uh, you know, we talked about it. Um, Steve Davis is ab actually thinks that Steve Fleming killed his sister. So in some respects, he didn't agree with the, the way the government presented it per se. But as, as Steve said to me, he has no doubt that Whitey Bulger and Steve Fleming conspired to kill his sister. He has no doubt in his mind. So, I mean, he was upset he was upset by the verdict. As he said to me, at least it wasn't a not guilty. At least it wasn't a not proven. They said it was no finding. That means the jurors were split on this, that some obviously believed that Bulger was present and involved in the murder, and some felt that the evidence was just too weak. It really did come down to Steve Fleming's word, uh, not necessarily against Whitey because he didn't take the stand, but it was Steve Fleming's word. And the jury had sat there for three or four days listening to how much of a degenerate Steve Fleming is. You have to understand, Judy, the, the, the bulk of the government case were from people, they were all admitted killers, drug dealers, and thugs. And so the jury had to parse that and go through it. From where I sit, I think they did a heck of a job. They did a really, really good job. How much damage was done to the FBI by this trial, by what was, what, Bulger's connection to the FBI? Well, this is actually, the damage to the FBI is going on for 20 odd years now. I mean, I was part of the Globe, the Boston Globe Spotlight team that exposed Bulger as an informant in 1988. The damage began then. Nine years later, Judge Mark Wolf, one of the few heroes in this sordid tale, was able to force the FBI to admit that Bulger was their informant. And then since that time, there has been a series of civil cases and other criminal cases. His, uh, John Conley, his FBI handler, is now doing 40 years for murder in Florida. This was the end, this was the denouement. This was the end of it all. Whitey going to trial. So we've actually known this. So the damage to the FBI was done. And that's one of the conflicts we saw that the, the victims' families did not like the way the government presented this case because they believed the government was minimizing FBI and Justice Department corruption. And that was a tactic used. The FBI did not want to play. That was, that was Bulger's defense. It was like, look at, look, don't pay attention to me. Pay attention to these corrupt FBI agents. As the jury saw through it, Judy, you know, the FBI clearly enabled and protected and actually helped Whitey Bulger kill people. But at the end of the day, it wasn't the FBI that shot people in the head, buried them in shallow graves and removed their teeth for, for identification purposes. It was Whitey Bulger. Well, remarkable story. Kevin Cullen with the Boston Globe. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. The notorious Boston crime boss, James Whitey Bulger, is dead one day after being transferred to a federal prison in West Virginia. His death is being investigated as a homicide. Several news organizations, including the Boston Globe, reported he was murdered in prison today by inmates associated with the mob. Bulger, who for years was one of America's most wanted criminals, ran gambling and drug rackets across Boston for decades. He was an FBI informant as well. Bulger was on the run for 16 years before he was eventually eventually caught and convicted in 2013 of participating in 11 murders in the 1970s and 80s. Emily Rooney of public station WGBH in Boston has long covered Bulger and his crimes, and she joins me now. Emily Rooney, thank you for talking with us. What is known about how he died? Well, he was only in the new prison. He had come up from Florida to West Virginia less than 24 hours. He was still in his wheelchair. 
I have heard some reports that he was surrounded by a mob of gang of people who viciously beat him. I can't corroborate that, but that's what I've heard. Which says something about uh, the, that federal prison. He had a. It may say more than that too. It may say that. They had transferred him there for a different reason, and there was somebody there waiting for him. We, we really don't know. You know a, lot of, a lot of questions. He started uh, on this criminal path uh, from a very early age. Tell us about his career. He was a criminal at age 13. You know, he was robbing convenience stores. He dropped out of school at the age of 14. He, he ran a criminal enterprise for decades and decades. You know, he had this charm and this sort of appeal that he, 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 he lured people into his, his, his net, including women. He, he, he often had two or three women going at a time. He took that one uh, on the road with him, but he tried to take the other one with him first, and she gave up and came home, and then he took Catherine Gregg on the road with him. Uh, he was he was an FBI informant. Uh, over what period of his life, and and how did that develop? Well, in 1975, he became an informant. What had happened was the uh, the, the DEA, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, wanted to bring down La Casa Nostra, the Italian mafia. In order to do so, they enlisted the help of the. Um, Winter Hill Gang, which was run by Whitey Bulger and all of his associates. They figured they'll turn a blind eye to rackets and numbers and some of the, you know, busting, you know, machines and that kind of stuff. But they also turned a blind eye to 19 murders. And then in uh, 1995, FBI agent John Connolly, who grew up in the same pr housing project as uh, Whitey Bulger and was in the FBI, tipped him off that he was about to be indicted. But you know, John Connolly has always contended to this day, hey, he was one of the guys. He was part of the team, and he feels like he took the fall for something that happened at a much higher level at the FBI. You mentioned murders. I mean, he killed people with his own hands. Oh, yes, and then he took naps afterwards. He killed at least two women, Deborah Hussey and uh, Deborah Davis. He was only convicted of one of those murders, but then he would pull their teeth out and you know, bury the remains so that they couldn't be as easily identified. We didn't have DNA testing back then. But the story of his life, I mean, it's been made into movies, uh, documentaries uh, yeah, about him. He, he'll be remembered for all of this. And the woman who was with him at the end, she's still serving time. So Catherine Gregg is still serving time. She was sentenced to a fairly minimum number of years, like seven or eight, but she refused to cooperate with some detail about, I don't know, other informants or where money was hidden, something like that. I can't remember the details of that. And she accepted more time in prison as a result. So she's still, I believe, in a, she's in a federal prison somewhere locally, I believe. But, uh, but what a legacy he has. Can you the end of this? I should say, by the way, that none of the victims in the greater Boston area are lamenting this at all. They're cheering. They're popping champagne tonight. But this is not the way his life should have ended. And the federal government has got some explaining to do. Emily Rooney with WGBH. We thank you.